talk about it in these studies, we're always trucking in questions of the authentic, right? So the authentic is a way to get at what we mean by subjectivity, by the realness of identificatory investments, all that stuff. It's authenticity. That's the term. And, and part of what makes people cringe is the fact that authenticity seems to always truck in these tests to vet those who belong from those who don't. Right? So to authenticate means to always be able to have the capacity to de-authenticate the others. Right? And so identities for people like Paul Gilroy, um, for folks like Anthony Appiah, become little more than prison houses right? um, that other people lock us into. So race is problematic, they argue. Because we have, and this is sort of our obvious term, because they are proper these scripts that we have to go by. If we don't follow the script, we're considered inauthentic, we're delegitimized, and we're not part of the collective fold. And they think that's problematic, and it is problematic, right? Um, but I want to say that when folks are talking about realness and identity, the only issue at stake is not simply authenticity that there's what Lionel Trilling once called the cognate ideal of authenticity, which is sincerity, which is another way, I would argue, of glimpsing what we mean by realness, right? When we say things like keeping it real, right? Trying to be real. Realness is about authenticity, but it's about something else. What I would argue is authenticity is excess, the remainder, the stuff that doesn't get in prison, right? Which is the reason why deconstruction as the end game in analytic and intellectual discussions about the stakes of doing race and theorizing race isn't enough. Because you can deconstruct rape race to death, and it will still live and more powerful in zombified form. Mm -hmm. um, the example I use in, in the second book is a guy named Leo Felton, who was famous because in 1999 he was, he was caught trying to pass off counter, counterfeit bills at the Dunkin' Donuts in Boston. When they caught him, locked him up, started to do a little research, they find out that, wow, there was an irony afoot. Because not only was he passing off counterfeit bills, he was a neo Nazi skinhead was using those counterfeit bills to finance you know, this scheme to blow up Jewish monuments and then bluish mon and black monuments throughout the Boston metropolitan area. But the irony was that he was himself passing for white. That is to say, he was the son of a black father and white mother. And he would go about his business in the world pretending with his neo-Nazi uh, friends that he was Italian. Now, journalists thought this was just a wonderful irony, right? That this guy wasn't even so sort of white, right? He had to pretend to be white to do these really nefarious <coughs> things. And he was committed. I mean, you know, he, you know, he had a long record of beating up black people, bus driving. Mean, he was genuinely committed to anti-blackness, to his to white purity, to whiteness. But when they asked him, well, you know, how could you be so pro-white? How could you be a white supremacist and also be, as, you know, at least as we constitute in the US, black? He said, well, no, your issue is you all are racial materialists. You all think race is biology and genetics, and it's not. So, I mean, in some ways, he has a de he has social constructionist argument in a certain kind of way, right? So, he says, race isn't about materiality. The folks I'm running with also have this antiquated 19th century materialist notion of what race is. Right? So, they're not enlightened enough to get it, which is why I had to pretend with them, because they, they wouldn't even understand, right? But what I recognize is race isn't about the body at all, it's about the spirit, it's about the soul, it's about what you feel. I talk a lot about feel in the book that comes out in April on race and paranoia, which is more of a trade book. This idea is analytic, I would call it metaphysic, metaphysics of feeling, right, in contradistinction to all the other ways we try to vet the other, is incredibly important for how we find an entry point into questions of what's real and what's not. And so for Leo Felton, he's able to have his cake and eat it too, right? He's able to say, well, race isn't biology, which is why I can identify, and I feel white, and therefore I operate in the world as though I'm white. I don't think I'm not being inauthentic, I'm not being, he's definitely not being insincere, right? Um, so, so I use all that to say, sincerity and authenticity, I would argue, are different. They function differently. They both try to find ways to make sense of what the stakes are in invoking, real, in invoking realness, but they do it in very different terms. And the photograph becomes a nice example to talk about that, and Randolph specifically, in his relationship to spirit mediumship, becomes another example of this. Because we would never imagine, say, a photograph to be characterized as sincere or insincere, right? Uh, even, even if we just think colloquially, right? So the photograph really doesn't have that capacity. Now we might imagine that the folks um, who are being photographed based on how they're performing themselves might be considered sincere or insincere. Even the photographer, right, based on whether or not he or she is tampering with the cellular or doing something else. And of course, spirit photography is all about that debate, right? Whether this is just some sort of objective cataloging what was or some purposeful manipulation of the tech of the, of the photochemical process to create an image right that isn't real right so, and so those folks have the capacity for sincerity and sincerity but not 
the actual material inner thing that is the photograph itself, right? So that distinction, I think, becomes a nice way to dramatize what I think mistakes are that different. Um, even the folks looking at the photograph, of course, so if you're looking at an image, say, of a, well, I'm, we're about to have a baby at the beginning of April, so I'm thinking of babies again. Looking at you know, the little baby, say, oh, how cute that baby is. Oh, what a cute little baby. You realize that baby's not cute at all, right? <laughs> that, you know, I think brothers are looking at the photograph, being not sincere and sincere. The photograph itself does not have that capacity. It doesn't matter. And so, and so part of what I want to argue is there's a way in which Randolph is thinking about his own relation to the account as being predicated on that difference between being able to perform a kind of agential and subjective version of him, his relationship to the other and being merely a vessel for the powers of uncontrollably foreign force and going to be out of his control.